Okay, uh, welcome to this semester's last Lunch and Learn. We're gonna miss you over the summer. Um, today's lecture is going to be the challenges and successes of leading a 3,000 plus campus community through a <laughs> pandemic. And we have two speakers today. First, we have John Wheeler. Give us a hi. Um, he's associate, associate provost for integrative science, uh, professor of chemistry, and importantly, relative to this talk, uh, he chaired Furman's public health and safety advisory group. All right. And first speaker is going to be Jason uh, Cassidy, associate vice president for student life and dean of students. And his main link was about 2,500 students and how to get them to behave doing a COVID-19. First up is Jason. All right. Well, thank you. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you all today. We haven't actually presented, I guess, on this. We've had thousands and thousands of conversations, uh, but this was actually a little bit of an exercise of reflection on the last two years, uh, which we've done again informally, but not in any formal way. So this was an opportunity to do that. Uh, before we jump in though, just to uh, share a little bit about more about ourselves, we'll do that and then we'll hop to the program. Um, as Dennis said, I'm the Dean of Students uh, in my day job, uh, but for the last two years, in particular, the, the, the year before last, the, you know, the 2020, 2021 academic year, um, set aside most of those duties um, and some colleagues picked up those responsibilities uh, so that I could uh, focus on uh, what I like to call kind of air traffic control. Uh, for all of our COVID uh, protocols and response. Uh, but I've been at Furman for 23 years, uh, originally from Atlanta, Georgia. So I don't know if anyone's from Atlanta, but grew up in Decatur, uh, but have been here uh, for the majority of uh, my life. Went to Bethany College in West Virginia, uh, Tanisha's College for my master's in Buffalo, New York, and then came here in 99, worked in housing for 12 years, and then in this role for the last uh, 11 years, and also earned my PhD from Clemson uh, while I was in my early part of my uh, career here at Furman, graduated in 05 with that. So before we jump into uh, our topic, I'll let my colleague tell a little bit about himself and then we'll get to it. Thanks, Jason. And I think uh, the title uh, air traffic controller is most appropriate for uh, Dr. Cassidy, but another one that he was uh, more affectionately known as in the, in the groups of Furman was COVID czar. Uh, and so anything that had anything to do with COVID that you needed an answer for, the first stop shopping uh, was Jason Cassidy. Every email that went to Furman Focused went directly to his inbox. And uh, I filled in a couple of weeks when Jason was out of town. And I can tell you that is many, many, many thousands uh, of emails that uh, he engaged with the public, with the community, uh, with the students, and so on. So a really superb job of leading this effort uh, all along. Again, my name is John Wheeler. I have been at Furman since 1991, so a little over 30 years now, uh, as a chemist. Uh, and over the last 15 years or so, I have led uh, Furman's efforts um, in the Office of Integrative Research in the Sciences, which means seeking out federal uh, research funding to support our students and our faculty in research across the sciences. Uh, a few years ago, my title uh, was changed just a bit to Associate Provost for Integrative Science, but really the responsibilities remain essentially the same. But uh, as a result of uh, maybe just being in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, I was selected to uh, direct the public health safety and advisory group. I do have a little bit of clinical uh, and immunological background. Uh, going way back to my PhD days, I uh, completed my PhD at the University of Cincinnati in the a, uh, medical school there primarily uh, and did some work in that area. Um, and uh, I'm originally from Kentucky. Uh, attended a small school in Kentucky, Georgetown College, uh, and uh, uh, located about 10 miles from where this year's Kentucky Derby winner uh, grew up. So uh, very familiar with the bluegrass area of Kentucky. Jason, I'll let you take it away. 
All right, so two other housekeeping items. One, we're sitting this way because uh, we're trying to speak to both you all, but also be on the camera over here uh, for, I guess, probably a group larger than this on Zoom. So we're trying to do uh, both audiences at the same time. Um, and I am standing uh, because I've got a little sciatic nerve thing going on. So just so you know, I'm, well, one sitting, one standing. So a uh, little, little housekeeping there. So as we were thinking through, uh, just because we don't have a ton of time, we actually want to give you all time for questions. And what I would, uh, let's see, let's see my clicking now. Give me one second. There we go. Um, please ask questions as we go. I know we're also monitoring the chat uh, in Zoom if you have questions there, uh, but we'll also carve out some time at the end uh, as well for some discussion. Uh, but as we were kind of piecing together uh, our thoughts and you know, two years ago was a long time. Um, a lot has happened since uh, March of 2020. And really, I went back through some of my emails and things. And the first thing we did uh, campus-wide was on February 28th, uh, we sent out an email to all of our students about spring break and just reminding them about this COVID thing that was out there. Uh, be safe, you know, wash hands. Uh, those kind of things. It was a real uh, simple email that uh, we were starting to get hints of this as we watched what was going on in the uh, world around us. Uh, it didn't take long uh, that we then, a few days later, canceled any summer or any spring break programs for Furman so, uh, that were out of the country. So, for example, actually this week, um, our seniors who were supposed to go to Ireland for a week with the Cawthorn Center back in March of 2020. Uh, graduated this past Saturday and had the option to go this week. Um, and so I think seven or eight of them are, are in Ireland today. They traveled yesterday or Sunday, maybe, um, and are making that trip up from two years ago uh, as alumni now because they all walked across the stage on Saturday. Um, spring break came, and that's kind of when for Furman when it all uh, started to become real. And uh, we had students all over the country and some uh, out, of, out of the country when uh, the World Health Organization declared COVID a pandemic and Furman canceled study away trips. Uh, we told all of our students who were on spring study away, you needed to find your way back to the U.S. because we were afraid you wouldn't be able to get back into the country potentially. Um, and again, remember this, we don't know at this time, two years ago, we knew a sliver of what we know now, um, and that's hard to sometimes remember. Uh, at, the, at this moment in time, uh, we didn't know anything uh, uh, institutionally. Um, the governor declared, uh, closed all public schools, which meant schools like Clemson and South Carolina had to close. Uh, Furman had more agency in this decision as a private institution, but we followed suit, uh, as did every other uh, school. And we, we closed and started to shift to uh, a remote work setting. And um, uh, as of March 18th, that, that year, there were 47 cases of COVID in South Carolina. And we had our first uh, confirmed case on March 23rd uh, with a student who reported to us. Um, so that gives you a little bit of the first month of a 24 month uh, saga. Um, where we didn't have protocols, we didn't have teams, we didn't, have, we were just reacting. We were trying to find out, you know, what are we, what's the CDC recommending, what's our governor telling us, um, and trying to figure out how to do this. Simultaneously, um, our faculty, uh, much like Ollie, uh, we had to shift to this online thing, which um, wasn't a thing uh, for Furman. We were all about in person. Uh, and doing, doing college that way. So cameras like this were uh, spread out all over uh, every academic classroom over the, that summer. Um, we set up an organizational structure, which ebbed and flowed. We made modifications as we learned. Some things worked, some things didn't. The name up here, you can see, you know, we started out because in our minds, all right, this was a, an adjustment for the spring of 2020. 
we were gonna take the summer to figure out, you know, hopefully this thing will die down and we'll be back in the fall. And so the first iteration of our coordinating team, we called the fall planning committee because we were thinking, all right, we just gotta figure this thing out for the fall semester. Um, but as you all know, it, it moved on and lasted longer. So that, that group changed its names a couple of times. Currently we're just a COVID response uh, committee. Uh, we had the public health and safety advisory group. We had an operational team, which, much, which was much larger. Um, and we had a team that met daily uh, doing testing and contact tracing, quarantine and isolation, monitoring all of that. And then we also had a student advisory group we pulled together a little bit later in the process to help us get student feedback, how are communications, clarity of communications, things of that nature. I think John wants to throw a little bit in there because I would put this as one of our successes. It was, it was absolutely one of our challenges to figure out how to structure a campus in a way that would manage this thing. But I also think it was ultimately one of our successes. Um, and John, I think we'll elaborate a little bit. Yeah, I would just add to that, that uh, I remember the initial meetings in March and April uh, when we were trying to decide how to even begin to think about responding uh, to the pandemic and how to organize the structure uh, of that. Uh, and uh, what we recognized early on was that all of this certainly can't be done by committee, uh, that we would need someone to lead the effort. Uh, and that's where Dr. Cassidy came in and has been a part of that and has been really the leader of that effort uh, all along. But there were so many different parts of this, ranging from how we were going to have to rearrange the classrooms, just the amount of furniture that we had to find some place to put, uh, because students had to be at least six feet apart, it was an enormous challenge. Uh, the committees that were operationally involved in the grounds and putting stickers up and signs up everywhere and thinking through those very detailed um, sorts of daily operational activities. At the same time, we wanted to take advantage of the expertise that we had on campus with a very strong clinical team. Furman is, is quite unique in a school of its size to have a student health center that's actually permanently staffed by a full-time physician. And to have that clinical expertise along with the expertise of three uh, terminally degreed epidemiologists who all have extraordinary experience in public health and in dealing with things uh, ostensibly like pandemics. So to bring those folks together on a team uh, to talk about the uh, scientific data and what we knew and what we didn't know about the pandemic. The advisory groups that had to figure out how to uh, manage things like quarantine and isolation where residential campus now, what do you do when 15 students get sick at the same time and all of them have friends and all of those friends are now contacts and very early on uh, in the pandemic, I'm sure you remember those days, uh, there was a, a big focus on the contact tracing uh, and then those individuals going into quarantine and it wasn't a short quarantine, it was two weeks. So where are we going to have enough housing uh, to take care of all of these folks? Dining facilities, uh, they're not allowed to leave their rooms. So how are they going to get food? How are we going to feed all of these individuals who ostensibly are contagious at the same time? Uh, and so just an enormous number of uh, things to think through that Furman had really, or any uh, university had really thought through before. And to Jason's point about the successes, uh, what has, I think, been so um, gratifying about this looking back is that those structures remain in place. I hope we'll never have to use them at the same level again for COVID. That is a question that remains open, uh, and, and we will see in, in due course. But we have learned so much about how to manage something like that, that if it were necessary, we could pull together that expertise very quickly uh, and understand much better uh, how to respond going forward in a way that at the time uh, we were all looking at each other and, and trying to learn and figure out what to do next, as were uh, all the other campuses, whether they were small universities or large universities across the country in that regard. The other thing I think that Jason pointed out that's very important is engaging students in that conversation to make sure uh, that their views were represented and that we weren't creating an environment. There's enough mental health uh, stress associated with this already, but to create an environment where students felt like 
uh, they were disenfranchised from the process. It's very important that we engage them uh, all along. So, so <clears throat> some key milestones for us uh, that we were working off of, or as we look back, I guess, uh, you know, the first big decision we had to make was in the summer of 2020. Were we going to be in person that fall or are we going to go remote? Uh, which a lot of schools, you'll remember, um, fully were fully remote. They did not bring students back to campus. Uh, we ultimately decided that we felt like we could, with the teams we had in place, we knew it would be a, an extraordinary amount of work. Uh, but we felt like Furman is an in-person institution, and if we can make this work and give the option to students to be remote if they chose to do so, which that adds another layer of complexity when you give options uh, to folks, um, we decided to go hybrid. And about 87% of our student body returned in the fall, and about 13% chose to be remote. And so what that means, though, is we were having to provide dual experiences uh, to students. Uh, it was interesting, one of the graduates, the, the speaker, actually, the student speaker at, at commencement Saturday night, her name's Rosie, she's from Korea, and she could not come back uh, because of uh, international regulations. Um, she did uh, three semesters online, uh, with a 13 hour time difference. So she did her schooling uh, on the opposite end of all of that. She's a phenomenal student, uh, but she reflected on that on Saturday night. But those are the type of situations we had to accommodate. At the same time, those same people that are providing that uh, virtual experience are also providing the in-person experience, at the same time, all of these safety protocols and how do we feed them, how do we quarantine and isolate them, how do we keep them engaged when they can't be in big social groups, how do we enforce the rules. The Farming didn't go out and hire a bunch of staff uh, to do this. We reallocated staff we had and thus uh, folks like John and I uh, and our responsibilities. So we did that. We had a successful uh, fall and spring semester of 2020 and 2021. Not an ideal experience. Our students, you know, it, it was not the best way to start your freshman college experience. My son actually is in that class. He started here in the fall of 2020. Um, not an ideal way to start off your college experience, but um, it was better than some other places where they started off completely virtually and, and had to uh, start off the college experience that way. Um, I think the next major milestone for us was were we going to require the vaccine or not? for our students. And this impacted you all um, in the OLLI program. Uh, we ultimately decided back in June of 2021 uh, that we were going to require the vaccine because at that time, what that was going to allow us to do uh, is have a minimal need for quarantine and isolation space because at that time, the vaccine was preventing folks for the most part from getting COVID. And if you were vaccinated, it took you off the list as a close contact who needed to be quarantined. And what we could not sustain was bringing all, because we didn't do virtual, we didn't offer virtual or remote options in the fall of 2021. Um, so what we, that, that meant all of our housing inventory was full. Um, we held out some space because our enrollment was down a little bit, uh, but we couldn't allow both a remote and a virtual experience and have students in and out of quarantine uh, like we did the previous uh, year. So we, we required the vaccine. Uh, that allowed us, honestly, to have a really positive, in the grand scheme of things, a positive fall 2021 college experience, of course, until uh, the variants started to uh, come into play and the vaccine no longer was as uh, effective. And uh, so then the next, uh oh, and the other milestone that semester for us was mask optional in non academic spaces, which was a huge um, uh, positive boost for our student body to know they could go in the dining hall, housing, the student center uh, without having to uh, be required to wear masks. They were only required in the academic settings. Um, the vaccine, we felt comfortable if we required the vaccine, we would be able to allow that as, a, as an offset. Um, and it worked. Um, again, of course, until Omicron came and over the uh, winter break uh, between 21 and 22, we were all convened again 
uh, when the CDC was changing its guidance to say you needed the booster uh, to now help uh, uh, mitigate against uh, the, the variants. And so, again, we ultimately decide, decided to require the booster, our students to get the booster, um, in order to return in the spring of 22. And we've been chasing some of that down all semester with our students because they all got vaccinated at various different times, right? So you know you have to wait a certain amount of time between your second dose of a vaccine and when you can get boosted. Um, but again, we felt like requiring the booster was going to give us our best chance of allowing the students to have an experience in, in this past spring that was as similar as possible to what they had in the fall. Uh, we started out really restricted for about the first three weeks, three or four weeks of the spring semester, but we're able to, as the cases uh, mitigated and our booster count uh, increased, uh, we're able to get back to that masking optional policy, um, uh, having student activities and engagement, which was really important for our students. And then ultimately on March 5th, uh, we went mask optional in academic buildings, which was kind of like the final almost final a large milestone for us. Um, the 18th, we no longer kind of had the public facing dashboard uh, anymore. All of these things behind the scenes are still happening. We still have our team. We were meeting weekly. We're watching the data coming from the health center uh, for students, human resources for employees. Uh, we, we reconvened a couple of times in preparation for commencement this past week, because you all know uh, positive case counts are increasing again a little bit. Uh, that's happened on campus with faculty, staff, and students as well. Um, but we were able to kind of uh, manage, watch through all that, make sure we were ready for an in-person commencement with lots of people on campus uh, this past weekend. Um, so those things are still in play. Uh, they're just going to become part of our normal fabric, if you will, of how we manage uh, a new virus. And Again, as John said, hopefully we won't have to reconvene all of these mega structures uh, in the future, but we, we now have kind of a roadmap to do that if we need to. I'll just add that the milestones that you see on the slide are not arbitrary in which Furman decided in this particular date to make this particular decision. They're led by the science of what was developed at that point. So why did Furman decide to require vaccines? Well, to that point, vaccines were simply not available uh, to our students. Uh, and once they became available, it became obvious that that was a very important additional layer of protection. Uh, the same thing with boosters uh, at the end of the year of this past year. And those layers of protection, along with masking, for example, uh, were very, very critical to our success in maintaining very, very low infection rates. So one of the things I think we're very proud of as, as a success at Furman is that if you look at our rates of infection for students and for faculty and staff over the last two years, they're extraordinarily low uh, compared with other campuses uh, around South Carolina uh, and even nationally. Although Furman is a bit unique in South Carolina, there were two schools that actually required vaccinations and one that required boosters uh, within our state. We are not unique nationally uh, and being unique locally actually contributed to a, a great deal to our success in terms of the number of students who went home sick, our ability to have students engage in a very normal uh, daily type of operation with their student programs, student life activities, their engagement in the classroom, uh, et cetera. Uh, other campuses that did not do that type of thing, even locally, had to take tests every week, uh, in some cases multiple times a week, uh, to determine if they were positive or not. So you're all familiar with that, having a Q-tip stuffed up your nose and, and so on. And uh, so this has uh, been a, a great success for Furman in terms of the outcome. One of the things that people ask, what is it like, you know, being air traffic control or COVID czar or whatever, what is it like managing a pandemic on a college campus? And I sat down and wrote this out, trying to figure out what this was like. So I'll just read this to you. The first year, 20, March 2020 to March of 21, was the equivalent of flying an airplane full of passengers while simultaneously building it without any blueprints and the airline expected every passenger and crew safety to be the top priority. And then the second year of the pandemic was the equivalent of modifying that same airplane 
with blueprints that changed often while still meeting safety expectations and customer satisfaction, <laughs> all the while justifying every decision to anyone who believed they were entitled to know. <laughs> and that really encapsulates what this was like. Like there, there has been nothing else like this in my career um, that comes even close. And I really hope there's nothing else in the remainder of my career that comes anywhere close to this. And I don't think this is just me. This is our, t I, think, I think this resonates with the COVID response committee, the public health and safety advisory group, the ops team, uh, Nancy and trying to figure out Holly, you know, uh, she's taking, she's doing this as it's being filtered through us um, and trying to figure out how do I then make this part of the plane work for this certain type of passenger being the Ali uh, students. And so um, it has been quite the undertaking. I mean, John hit it on the head with uh, thousands, thousands of emails, thousands of meetings, um, websites and phone calls and, and panels and town halls. Um, I think we looked back, we, we put out 150 formal communications to the campus community, students, parents, throughout that period of time. And that might seem like, well, okay, two years, 150 communications. Every single one of those communications were drafted and then reviewed by a team, vetted by our legal counsel, uh, edited again. Uh, we had students read some of them to say what's unclear. So every time one of those messages came out on Friday, the firm and focused email update, that thing had been uh, drafted days earlier and reviewed by uh, lots of people. Uh, and every single time one would go out, it would generate a flood of questions back and opinions, uh, uh, suggestions. Um, and, and we were going to take the approach that we we're going to respond to those. Um, and we did. And, and uh, but it was it was quite the uh, quite the undertaking. So I would I would again, that's a challenge, uh, but also a success. Um, you know, Furman is an is is a you know it, it is a business, right? There is a bottom line to run a college, a, a university, and if you don't have students here uh, paying tuition, paying housing, paying for meals, um, that resulted in the summer of 2020 and staff having to be furloughed and having uh, all faculty and staff salaries reduced uh, that year. Um, it, that was just as a result of uh, refunding the second half of the spring semester of 2020. If we're looking forward to having to be remote for the fall of 2020 and or the spring of 2021, that means people are going to get laid off. Uh, there is no way to run an institution uh, financially without that, that revenue stream coming in. And we are what's called a tuition-driven uh, institution, meaning we rely on that. We don't get a lot of government funding like state schools do. We're a private institution. And that's a whole nother maybe Ollie session we could talk about as financials of an institution. But so we're constantly having to balance that, but also the priority being student, faculty, staff, Ollie, community safety. And where's the right balance between uh, keeping people safe within reasonable expectations, but also uh, part of that safety is mental health, is financial health, right? People being employed, um, that if, you, if you're not employed, that results in other issues. So we're constantly walking this uh, tightrope uh, for the last two years. So I want to just simply add to that, and I think it's covered well in the customer satisfaction part and what Jason had just referred to. But you all know from watching the new, uh, media for the last two years that this event is a very polarizing event as well. So trying to manage the tightrope of following the science, making the best decision and putting public health first, and yet at the same time, managing all those questions from very different viewpoints uh, was maybe the most time consuming challenge of anything we did from parents who are all considered part of our customers as well. Every response that came into Firm and Focus not only received a written response, but if requested a phone call, a conversation, uh, et cetera, to explain decisions that were made. Uh, and that was an, 
an incredible additional load on the staff, on Jason, on others uh, to manage that through the entire time of the uh, pandemic without any additional staffing, in fact, a loss of staffing that occurred through a variety of different mechanisms uh, during that time. So. We'll probably hit some more challenges and successes as you all have questions because we do want to leave time for that. Our last kind of slide here is just tips for as we again reflect back, what are some things if we had to tell someone else how to do this? Um, what are some highlights of some things? And I won't read through all of this. You all can see this and maybe we can talk a little bit about it. Um, I reflected on these. I, I taught a class on crisis management to graduate students at Clemson about a month ago um, in the student affairs program, which is the kind of credentialing of folks that work in my field, in student affair, college student affairs. Um, and I shared some of these uh, bullets with them, and we've, we've modified them a little bit, but, you know, um, expect the unexpected became kind of a mantra. We, we know we're not out of the woods or something going to come. There could be a variant. We don't know what it's going to do. We don't know if the booster or the vaccine is going to work. So everything was, um, I, I think I've used the word, have a, 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 a contingency plan. The word contingency, I used probably the last two years more than I ever used in the previous <laughs> 45 of my life. Um, but that's what it was all about. Is This is where we are today. You want to know, can you do this in a month from now, as of today? Yes, this is what you can do, but have a contingency plan because we don't know what's going to be happening in a month from now. And so that was often our response. And that's a really hard way to run an organization is, you know, Ollie's trying to plan for next semester. Can we do this? Is this program? As of today, Nancy, yes, this is going to be the plan, but have a contingency plan because, you know, who knows in two months uh, when that program actually starts, where we will be as a community uh, world and so forth. Um, communication, I, I think identifying leaders, structure, I mean, those of you who have who've worked in business or organizations, wherever, these are all, this isn't rocket science on, from that front. Um, but communication was huge, is huge, um, and we placed a lot of emphasis on that. Um, and it was hard to people hear people say, you know, you need to communicate more, you need to communicate better. Um, this isn't clear. Um, I don't read emails. You need to communicate with me differently. Um, you know, so you just kind of put your head down and go with what's going to be the best way to, to go, knowing that there's going to be opinions and criticisms and things on the on each side um, of that. Um, and so I think the final thing I would end with and we'll open up for questions is really just one of my biggest takeaways is uh, we have to extend kindness to each other and grace. I mean, this was, this isn't just Furman. You all live through this every family member, other industries. I mean, this was a global, is, was a global adjustment. And, um, you know, my takeaway is we have got to be more gracious with people, kinder to people, give others the benefit of the doubt. Um, and also I tried to put myself in the shoes of students and families. This is their one and only college experience, right? And to have, can you can imagine your senior year you were a senior in the spring of 2020. You know, I, I tried to give grace when they were ugly about the fact that we commit, you canceled commencement or whatever, because that's a milestone event in their life that they didn't get to have, right? At that time, we did have it um, last year uh, for them, but still, it's just not the same. And this generation of students, that has been their lived experience. My son is a, a junior now, he didn't have a normal high school graduation. He didn't have a normal freshman year of college. He had a disrupted sophomore year with this year with varying policies. But, you know, I'm hoping this will make them a more resilient um, generation who is uh, maybe more grateful for things that happen in certain ways. And maybe there's different skill sets that they've developed that previous uh, student generations have. And that'll be to be determined. Why don't we open it up to some questions that are either on uh, Zoom yeah, or in the audience? We can start with the audience. Yeah. Yeah. 
Last Sunday, 60 Minutes did a segment on uh, adolescent uh, depression due to the COVID. Anything across the campus as far as mental health issues being on the rock, the isolation and the separation from family and college friends? Yeah, so just in case for the Zoom group, um, question is about mental health of the student body. Do we see anything, depression and others? Um, it's so the, the short answer is yes. Um, the more complicated answer is uh, we have been seeing, seeing a rising uh, increase in depression and anxiety in this generation of students for the last decade. Um, and then COVID just kind of took it, the pandemic took it and ratcheted up another level. So fortunately at Furman, we have a really robust counseling center compared to a lot of colleges our size. So we're fortunate in that. Again, they had to adjust and do things they've never done before, like uh, tele mental health, uh, which they put into place quickly to help connect with our students who were home or wherever they were in the summer of 20, when they were told not to come back to campus after spring break. When you, you there's those laws about uh, providing therapy across state lines, um, you have to be uh, licensed to do that. And there was some, um, uh, uh, the, the industry in some states uh, kind of gave a window where they said, we'll relax that requirement because of what's going on. Other states wouldn't. So it's not as easy as say, hey, just put your counselor online and we'll do this on Zoom. Uh, there were some legal things that you were not allowed to do if that student was in, a, in another state where you weren't licensed to practice. Um, and so we had to work through all of that. I think we will keep actually is the ability to do that now, uh, which we haven't, we didn't have in place uh, before. But the biggest struggle I think was our students' inability to have a social connection with each other, especially in that first kind of, I would say, fall of 20 into the spring of 21, where we were really, there was no vaccine for them yet. So they were very restricted on, they couldn't have any big social gatherings. Uh, no parties, no events, um, everything was in small pods. And uh, that was really hard uh, for them, uh, for sure. I think it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, probably for a while to do direct correlations to determine you know, the stress that we have seen in this age group as it has increased through the pandemic. But what's directly attributable to the pandemic and what's, uh, what do we call a pandemic effect? But certainly uh, there has been um, an increase and was very early on a significant increase that was self-reported by students in the time that uh, Jason was referring to where we were first um, disaggregating students in terms of their activities. That's why I think it's so critical and been such a success for Furman going back to the success stories that uh, we were able to remain a residential campus uh, during the entire pandemic. Uh, the first fall term was the most difficult in terms of student organizations uh, being able to meet a full capacity, but even then uh, there was an outlet, there was opportunity for students to get together in groups if they were distanced and outside and so on. Uh, and that's where a lot of students from high school, for example, uh, students that we're seeing coming in now uh, in classes that were entertaining in the fall this past year didn't have as much of that if they were uh, not engaged in some way in a residential environment in which they were accustomed. So I think we're seeing it uh, at that level as well. How did you handle students who did not get vaccinated or because of So we actually followed our pre-COVID protocol. We, we already required as a residential campus certain immunizations. And, but there was a medical contraindication exemption form that a doctor had to fill out and give to our health center. Uh, we also allowed for religious exemption. Um, those were the two normal categories. Those are the two current categories moving forward. Um, what we did put into place, um, and this was something we chose to do. A couple other schools did this. We, we thought that was something that would work well for us is we did allow students to request a strong personal exemption uh, to the vaccine. Uh, so we were at 93% vaccinated going into the fall 21 semester, or fall 20 semester, or fall, fall 21 semester. Um, 
And what, what those students had to sign was, I understand that I will not be allowed to quarantine or isolate on campus. I'll have to go off campus to do that. Berman's not responsible for uh, making remote access to classes available to me. So we allowed them to, and this really applied to all um, exemptions, but they had to, had to understand that they were, they were the ones who would have to quarantine if they were a close contact by CDC definition. Um, and so about 7% of the student body fell into that category. Um, what we felt comfortable about is that was such a small number that the, the mass uh, who were vaccinated helped us reach that, if you want to use herd immunity uh, category or whatever, that we felt comfortable with the masking uh, uh, policy we had that fall with the quarantine isolation policy, allowing them to have some engagement. So we did allow that. Interestingly, that number is actually smaller now than it was as, as people have seen the vaccine's effectiveness and or uh, the FDA, if you want to call it approval, we, that's again a whole other conversation from the emergency approval. Right. Uh, but some are waiting for that. And then some, you know, wanted to study away, wanted to leave the country and, and not Furman, but those countries were requiring that. So, for example, we have students on May X right now going this week to other countries who were strong personal exemption to the vaccine early on, but ended up having to get it in order to travel and go to that experience, which was their choice to do that. Um, so that SPO, strong personal exemption, is a little bit. Uh, objection rather is a little bit smaller now. And so going forward, there's not a strong personal objection. Right. Uh, that is not a opportunity going forward for our class that's coming in in the fall, for example. There is a vaccination requirement that's on the same form as your Tdap and mumps and all those kinds of things that you're required to have to go to college. That said, they can still have a medical exemption or a religious exemption as they would always have been able to have uh, uh, had that opportunity, but the strong personal exemption just because I'm opposed to the vaccine has been removed. And the primary reason for that is for no longer under emergency use authorization of the vaccine. So it is uh, approved at the same level as other vaccines in that regard. Uh, going forward, and again, that gets into a whole other question, what happens if the vaccine is changed in the future and where do we go from here and so on um, is, is an unknown. Uh, the expect the unexpected part of this, I put that quote in there at the end, uh, regardless of how you may feel personally about Dr. Fauci, and I know he's been in the news a lot or so in the last couple of years, but that quote uh, still holds true, uh, very true for where we are right now, where we might be in the fall, which is we don't make the timeline, the virus makes the timeline, and his quote was from March 23rd, 2020, who knew at that time uh, that this would have unfurled and looked like this. Uh, here we are in uh, May of 2022, so uh, some of that story is yet to be written. Time for one more. Um, I was curious if you have any uh, documentation about percentage of non-vaccinated who might have gotten sick versus the unvaccinated. We kept, we kept those statistics uh, uh, internally. We did not publish those statistics early on. It was certainly the case, and of course it has waned to some degree over time, that those who were vaccinated and those ultimately who were boosted were um, much less likely. Uh, it was about a 10 to 1 ratio uh, initially uh, um, that we were seeing, which is consistent with, I think, some of the national data that was published at that time. So those who had been vaccinated versus those who had been unvaccinated, we were seeing about a 10 to 1 in terms of the proportion of uh, individuals who were uh, ending up uh, positive. Uh, from that standpoint. Now, as we've gone forward in time and more variants have evolved and sub-variants to the variants that aren't even reported have evolved and so on, why we see that has uh, waned to some degree even with the booster. And you're seeing that in the community prevalence now, I think. So. Growing up during the polio epidemic, <laughs> you didn't question right. vaccination. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.